Hello everyone, Luke McElfresh here again. Today's video will cover some practice problems from chapter 6, which is discounted cash flow evaluation. So hopefully after reading the chapter and going through the chapter Learn Smart, you have noticed that chapter 6 utilizes the same ideas as chapter 5, which was time value of money. The difference being that in chapter 5, we utilize time value of money with a single cash flow. So we took a cash flow that was either in time period zero, so in present value terms, and figured out what it would be at some point in the future, so calculating future value, or we took a cash flow that we knew or expected to receive at the future, or in the future, so we took that future cash flow and we discounted it back to a present value. So chapter five dealt with one cash flow. In chapter six, now we introduce projects that include multiple cash flows. So we will be calculating the present value and the future value of, of projects that have multiple cash flows. Uh, we start off with projects that include multiple cash flows of different sizes, so meaning different amounts. And then we introduce annuities, uh, where we have annuities and perpetuities, where we have a constant cash flow of the same amount that occurs every period throughout the project. So let's just jump into things by looking at this first uh, example. If the relevant interest rate for the following cash flows is 9.6% per year, what is the present value and the future value of the cash flow? So we have two calculations that we are going to do here. Uh, whenever you have projects that have multiple cash flows, whether they be the same amount or of different amounts, I do recommend starting each uh, problem by drawing uh, a timeline. So the timeline helps you visually see when the cash flows occur, and it also helps you see how many cash flows you actually have. So for this timeline, we start off in year zero, and we do not have any cash flows that are occurring. In year one, I have a cash flow of $25,400. In year two, I have a cash flow of $27,300. In year three, I have a cash flow of $31,250. And in year four, I have a cash flow of $18,450. I'm going to first solve for the present value of this cash flow stream. Two different ways that you can solve for the present value. One is you could utilize what we learned in Chapter 5, and you could take each one of these cash flows and discount them back to a present value separately, and then add them all together to get the present value of all of the cash flows, discounting them back at 9.6% per year. Now, you would take 25400 and discount it back one period since it occurs in year one. 27300 two periods because it occurs in year two, and so forth for the next two cash flows. However, there is an easier way or a, a, uh, there is a way that you can solve for the present value of these cash flows in less steps by utilizing the net present value function on your financial calculator. So net just meaning total present value of multiple cash flows. So what we need to do here is tell our calculator when does the cash flows actually occur, when do the cash flows actually occur. To do so, we are not going to use the time value of money row on our calculators. We actually are going to use the cash flow register. So you should see on your second row next to, this, uh, next to the yellow second button, a button that says CF. When I click on CF, you should see CF0. The, before you begin any of these problems, you should always clear your financial calculator. So how do I clear the settings of my cash flows? You're going to hit the second button, and then you're going to hit clear work, which is the CE dash C or C E vertical line C button and it's going to clear whatever's been in your cash flows from previous problems. So once again I'm going to go back and I'm going to hit the CF button and you're going to see CF0. CF0 represents the cash flow that is already in time period zero. If I look up at my timeline, do I have a cash flow in year zero? No. So what do I put for CF0? I'm going to input the, the value of zero. And when you are using the cash flow uh, function on your financial calculator, the only way that you can store your values, so having the values actually stored in there, is you must hit the enter button, which is up there at the top left, second from the left, on your top row of buttons on your financial calculator. Enter and equals are not the same thing on our financial calculators. If you hit the equals button, it is not actually going to store that value into your financial calculator. Once I have hit enter and stored the value, I'm going to hit the down arrow. When I hit the down arrow, you should see CO1. CO1 represents the cash flow that occurs in time period 1. This is where it's beneficial to have the timeline. What is the cash flow that occurred in time period 1? That is $25,400. What do I have to hit to store this value? I have to hit enter to store it. And when I push the down arrow, I'm now going to see F01. F01, as you can see, is preset to one. 
The F stands for frequency. So how often does that cash flow occur consecutively? We are trying to tell our calculator, does this cash flow only occur once or does it occur in years one, two, and three, uh, for example? The only time that you would utilize or change the F on your financial calculators, for example, is let's say I had a three-period investment and I had $100 in years one and two and then $200 in year three. In this particular example, I could change the frequency of that $100 cash flow to two since it is occurring two years in a row. For our purposes here, and it might just be more beneficial to keep it uh, consistent and simplified, just keep that F as one since it only occurs one time. I then hit enter to make sure that it's stored in there correctly and I push down. I see CO2. CO2 represents the cash flow that occurs in time period two. So I have 27,300. I hit enter. I push down. I see F02. Once again, F just stands for the frequency of that second year's cash flow. It only occurs once, so I keep it as one, and I hit down. Well, you can hit enter also and then hit down. Then I see CO3. CO3 is the third year's cash flow of 31,250. To store it, I must hit enter. I push down. F03 equals the frequency of that cash flow. It is just one. I hit enter. I push down. CO4 equals 18,450. I push enter. I push down. F04 equals one. I always recommend continuing to push down just to check the next year's cash flows to make sure that there's nothing stored in there. But what I've done now is I've told my calculator, these are the cash flows that occur in year one, two, three, and four. So I've actually uh, transferred this timeline that we drew into my calculator to let the calculator know when the cash flows occur. So the one thing that I have not input is the discount rate. So my next step is to hit the NPV button. When you hit the NPV button, you should see an I. The I represents your discount rate. So in this particular problem, for this I, I'm going to hit 9.6 since that is my discount rate. What do I have to hit to make sure it's stored in there? You might have guessed it. It is enter. I push the down button. I should see NPV equals, and it shouldn't say anything. The next step then is to just hit the CPT button. When you hit compute, it will end up giving you the net present value of these cash flows, which ends up being 82,425 dollars and 32 cents. So what we've done here is we have calculated the future value or the present value of multiple cash flows of different amounts. Okay, so we have taken all of our cash flows and put them now into time period zero. Hopefully this makes sense to you that it would be, the, it would be less than the sum of these because we are taking future cash flows and discounting them back due to the fact that I have to wait one, two, three, and four years to receive some of these cash flows. Now the second part of the problem asks for what is the future value of these cash flows. So similar to our first problem, I'm going to go ahead and erase some of this up here on our timeline with our present value calculations. One way that you could solve for the future value of multiple cash flows is to take all of these cash flows and now you would compound them to a future value individually. So I'll take that 25,400 and compound it three periods at 9.6% to calculate a future value. I'll take the 27,300 and compound it two periods. I'll take the 31,250 and compound it one period. And if you notice, I'm not going to do anything to the 18,450 because it's already in future value terms. I would add all of these together and I would have the future value of all of these different cash flows. The other way that you could solve this is that since I have all of the cash flows in present value terms when I calculated my net present value, I now am only dealing with one single cash flow that is in time period zero. So what could I do if I have one single cash flow? I could use the time value of money functions that we did in chapter five, where the present value equals the present value that we just solved for. I'm going to solve for the future value. My payment is zero. My N is the four years. And the IY is that relevant interest rate of 9.6%. When I solve for the future value, you would end up getting a value of 118,000.
$933.13. I like this second method because the net present value calculations, I, in my opinion, are, are relatively straightforward. And then once I get them all in present value terms, then I'm only dealing with one single cash flow. And then I can just compound that one single cash flow, which in this case was the $82,425.32. And I can compound that one single cash flow, four periods, five periods, 10 periods, whatever it may be, to solve for a future value. So that is how you would solve for the present value and the future value of multiple cash flows of different sizes. You will utilize the net present value function. Um, if you're solving for the present value of multiple cash flows, you will utilize the net present value and then time value money if you're solving for the future value. So that is solving for the present value and the future value of multiple cash flows of different sizes. The next step that we will go through is solving for the present value and future value of cash flows of this same amount which in this case now introduced this concept of an annuity. Okay, so now we are going to move on into cash flows of the same amount dealing with annuities. So I'm going to actually go ahead and um, erase some of this so that I can write out what the formulas are for these problems if you choose to solve them algebraically. And then I'm actually going to solve them using the financial calculator again. Um, once again, you can solve these problems using the financial calculator. You can solve them utilizing Excel. Um, but it's a little bit simplified if you utilize the financial calculator. But it's important to understand what are you actually inputting and what are you actually doing when you utilize the calculator or Excel, not just... Uh, plugging in numbers. Okay, so in this cal or in this chapter with annuities where we have a constant cash flow occur occurring, um, the definition of an annuity has three characteristics. Constant cash flow, so the same amount, equally spaced, so every month, every year, whatever it may be, for a finite period of time, meaning that it stops after some period of time. We have two equations. We have annuity present value, which says you take whatever that constant cash flow is and you multiply it by 1 minus the present value factor, which is 1 divided by 1 plus r to the t power. Hopefully you kind of remember that from chapter 5. And then we divide this whole thing by r. Again, that's your interest rate per period. Same with the t. The, that's your total number of compounding periods. And then if I wanted to solve for the annuity future value, what we do is we solve for an annuity future value factor which I then multiply by whatever the cash flow is that's in present value terms. So in this case, or whatever that constant cash flow is, sorry, I would take 1 plus r to the t power minus 1, and I divide this whole thing by r. So I'm actually going to jump down to the second problem and then come back to the first one. It says, suppose you are offered annual cash flows of $2,250. This is that constant cash flow that occurs every time period. Uh, for each of the next seven years, beginning at the end of this year, discount rate is 8%. How much would you be willing to pay for this cash stream? So what they are asking for is the present value of an annuity because I'm receiving the constant cash flow each year for the next seven years. If you're unsure as to whether or not you're solving for an annuity or a constant cash flow, draw that timeline. So for each of the next seven years, I am going to be receiving 2000 $250. Hopefully you can just see that this is a constant cash flow that occurs every period for whatever I'm going to input in as my end. So here I have present value, future value, payment, N, and IY. And if you watched the last video, you'll realize that I always keep these together because those all need to be input in on the same basis. And you're going to see how that's important as we move into the next problem uh, in, this, in this extra practice document. So I want to know how much am I willing to pay today for this cash flow stream? The constant payment that occurs every period for the seven years I have for my N is the $2,250. I'm going to have that as a positive value because that is a cash inflow. I would be receiving it. So if that's what is going to come out as a positive value, what I'm receiving, the present value, what I'm paying for, is going to come out as a negative, representing a cash outflow. My discount rate here is 8% per year. 
sorry about that. I had somebody pop in while I was making this video. So uh, just to recap some of what's going on here in this problem, we have an annuity where we are receiving a constant cash flow of $2,250 each year for the next seven years. So as I mentioned previously, an annuity is uh, defined as constant cash flow, so in this case a $2,250, equally spaced in this case each year for a finite period of time, which in this case is seven years. So my payment is $2,250 positive, as that would be a cash inflow. I received seven of them, so my N is seven. My discount rate is eight. I know I'm solving for the present value of these. The only input that I have not yet included is future value. When we have an annuity such as this, the future value is actually going to be zero dollars. So the, the future value is zero, because I'm not receiving an additional cash flow at the end of this seven-year period that needs to be discounted back. So if I look at my timeline, I have the 2250 but there's nothing else here at the end of the seven years. I don't want to double count that last $2,250 because once I put it in there for the payment, my calculator knows that it occurs every period for whatever I put in there for the end. So if I were going to put future value equals 2250 I would actually be double counting that last cash flow. The only time you would have a future value uh, when you're dealing with an annuity is if you would receive an additional cash flow at the very end of that annuity time period. So once again, when I solve for the present value here, I end up getting a present value of 12000 sorry, $11,714.33. So this is solving it with the financial calculator. You can also solve this on Excel. You would now utilize a payment, uh, the payment function. Again, those Excel equations are listed in the Chapter 5 uh, folder or the Chapter 5 PowerPoint uh, dealing with the, with the calculator if you would like to utilize Excel. Or you could even solve this using the future value or the present value equation from above. So if I were utilizing the annuity present value equation from, an, uh, from above, so annuity present value, it would be the constant cash flow, which is the C, which in this case would be $2,250 multiplied by, and it would be 1 minus 1 divided by 1 plus R, which is 8% to the T power, which is 7, and I would divide this whole thing by 0.08. So if you were going to solve it algebraically, you would end up getting the exact same equation. Now, working our way back up, and the reason why I wanted to do this one first was this is an annual compounding equation or annual compounding scenario. If I look at the one up above it, now we are dealing with, okay, uh, it says I'm carefully going over my budget. I've determined that I can afford to pay $510 per month towards a new car, and I call up the local bank and find out that the interest rate is 24% for three years. How much can I borrow? The key here is that it is $510 per month, so everything is going to need to be input in on a monthly basis. So if I have present value, future value, payment, N, and IY, my payment and my N and my IY all need to be input in on a monthly paint or on a monthly basis, all because of this five hundred and ten dollars per month. Everything is going to be uh, input on input in as a monthly basis. They want to know how much can I borrow. So this is how banks and uh, lending institutions identify. Uh, the amount that you uh, of a loan is they identify what are you able to pay on a monthly basis towards that loan. So in this case, the monthly payment is $510, which is a cash outflow, as that would be an actual payment. I'm solving for the present value. That's the amount that I'm going to borrow, and it would be a positive value because I would be receiving that amount. The N is the total number of payments. It is a three-year loan, but with monthly payments, it's a total of 36 payments on this particular loan. The interest rate is 24%. That's 24% per, for the year. On a monthly basis, I need to divide that by 12, and I get an interest rate per period of 2%. When I solve for the future, what would be the future value, I don't have an additional cash flow at the very end of the period. The future value would end up being zero. I don't want to double count that 510. Similarly to the, to the last problem when I uh, didn't want to double count the 2250, I don't want to double count that 510 in the last period. Only time you would have a future value is if there is an additional cash flow that occurs at the very end of, in this case, the three years. When I solve for the present value, I get $12,999.31.
comes out as a positive because my payment was negative. If I did not put the payment as negative, it would come out as a negative present value, but we realize that would be the amount that I'm borrowing, representing a cash inflow. That's the amount that I'm borrowing, and then I'm paying it off with $510 each month for the next three years. Once again, if you are solving this using the equation, the annuity present value would be the constant cash flow of $310 multiplied by 1 minus... 1 divided by 1 plus the interest rate. Again, this is per period. So what is the per period interest rate? It is 2%. And what is the total number of periods? 36. Again, the 2% is the interest rate per period. That is my R. You would find out that you get the same value of $12,999.31. So roughly $13,000 is what I would be able to borrow if I can afford to pay $510 per month for the next three years and the bank is charging 24% interest on that particular loan. The key with both our calculator inputs and with the equation is that just like I group these together because they all need to be input in on the same basis, even if I use the equation, all of these are input in on the same compounding period basis. So whether it be monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, whatever it may be, they all are input in on the same basis. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. I've just purchased a $275,000 home. Well, actually, I'm going to skip that one and go to the next one and come back to it. Again, uh, I want to do the annual before I go to the uh, more frequent compounding. So I just borrowed $8,000 to buy a new car. The loan calls for monthly payments. Well, actually, this one's monthly as well. Um, so what is the amount of each payment? So once again, let's just identify what we are solving for. We have our five inputs present value, future value, payment, N, and IY. This one's a little bit different because they want to know what is the amount of each payment. So hopefully you're realizing that we are dealing with an annuity where we have a constant payment each month. So I will be solving for this payment function. Um, since it calls for monthly payments, all of my inputs need to be input in as uh, on a monthly basis. I just borrowed $8,000. That is the amount that I am paying off. I'm going to represent it as a positive value because that's the amount that I borrowed. And then when, since I have that listed as a positive value, the payment is going to end up being a negative value representing a cash outflow. This is a five-year loan, but with monthly payments, I'm going to make a total of 60 payments. The interest rate per year is 6%, but on a monthly basis, it is going to be 0.5% per month. And then once again, I don't have an additional cash flow at the very end of the five-year period, so my future value is going to be zero. You can also think of this as, okay, I'm borrowing $8,000 today. I'm making these constant payments each month for the next five years. My future value on this loan would end up being zero because I'm paying off the entire amount of this loan. So when I solve for the payment, you should get a value of negative 154 and 66 cents. Is this an actual negative value? No. It's saying that I would have to pay this $154.66 in order to pay off an $8,000 loan if the loan details were for five years with monthly payments at an interest rate of 6%. If you were solving this algebraically, going back up to our equation here, you would actually be solving for... the payment portion of this equation. So it's a little bit more complex when you're solving it algebraically. You would just get this 1 minus the present value factor divided by uh, the interest rate per period and then divide the annuity present value, which in this case is the $8,000, and divide it by that to get the actual uh, constant payment. Whichever way uh, you would like to solve these, uh, you'll get the same answer either way, Whether e even if you're utilizing Excel. So personal preference on that one, my personal preference, is to utilize the financial calculator. Now let's take a step up uh, to a, a little bit more complex problem. I've just purchased a $275,000 home. I was able to put down 20% and then I got a 30-year fixed rate mortgage at 5.75% for the balance. What are the monthly payments? So once, it, once again, we can see that we're solving for an annuity constant cash flow, a constant payment that's occurring every month or every time period for some finite period of time. And once again, it is monthly. So everything needs to be input in on a monthly basis. So once again, I have present value, future value. I have payment, I have N, and I have IY. 
I will group these together and understand that they need to be input in on a monthly basis. We've identified payment as being the function that we need to solve for. Now I need to know what the other inputs are. Some of these are relatively easy. So it's a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. So 30 years is my N, but it's monthly payments. So 12 payments a year for a total of 360 total payments. Interest rate. The interest rate for the year is 5.75%, but everything needs to be input in on a monthly basis. So once again, I need to input this as a monthly interest rate, so I'm actually going to divide this by 12 since the 5.75 is an annual rate, and I want a monthly rate. When I divide this, I get 0.479167, and again, there are most likely values, or there are values, after the 7 of my decimal. In order to ensure that the full decimal is actually uh, stored in my IY, as I mentioned in the last video, these are your steps. Hit 5.2 or 5.75 divided by 12 equals, and then push the IY button, and it will store the entire decimal value in your IY uh, input. Now it's a little bit more of the confusing part. The payment is going to pay off this loan, so the, I don't have an additional cash flow at the very end of these 30 years or at the very end of this 360 payment, so my future value is zero. Now, what do I put for the present value? It says that I purchased a $275,000 home, but I was able to put down 20%. So the loan balance is only going to be 80% of 275000 so if I were going to do 0.8 of 275, I would end up getting a value of 220,000. So since I put down 20%, the loan amount is actually going to be 220,000. Now I can solve for the payment. When I solve for the payment and I input that present value as a positive, I should get a negative payment and I end up getting a value of $1,283.86. Is that actually a negative value? No. It just represents that I would uh, that would be a cash outflow. If I borrowed two hundred twenty thousand dollars to buy a home, I'm going to have to pay one thousand two eighty three eighty six per month to pay off that amount that I'm borrowing. If the loan details are a thirty year fixed rate mortgage at five point seven five percent with monthly payments. Okay, moving forward. I have an outstanding balance on a credit card of $1,200. Unfortunately, I can only pay $20 per month. The interest rate on the card is 15.6% compounded monthly. So once again, all of my end payment and IY need to be input in on a monthly basis. How long will I need to pay off the credit card? So hopefully now you are realizing that we are dealing with a length, so we are solving for the end. So I have present value, future value. I have payment. I have N and I have I Y. As I mentioned previously, these inputs all need to be input in on a monthly basis. So let's just go ahead and walk ourselves through the information that's provided. I have an outstanding balance on my credit card of $1,200. If that's what my balance is today, that is my present value. That is the amount that I am paying off. I'm only able to make $20 payments per month. So when I solve for the payment, or when I input the payment, it's going to be $20. And since that is a cash outflow, it is going to be a negative value. The future value on this loan is going to be zero. I'm going to pay off the entire amount of this loan. There's no additional cash flow at the end of this. We're solving for the end, and my interest rate is 156 However, that 15.6 is an annual rate, so I need to divide it by 12 to get the monthly rate since everything needs to be input in on a monthly basis, and I get 1.3% per period or per month. When I solve for the N, I end up getting 117.23. Does that mean 117 years to pay off this $1,200 balance? No. Since everything was input in on a monthly basis, it's going to provide my output in that same time frame. So it's 117.23 months. If it asked for the number of years, we would just take this and divide it by 12 since there are 12 months in a year and you would find out that it would take you approximately nine and three quarters of a year to pay off this $1,200 balance if you can only pay $20 a month. Now if you're doing this uh, along with me and you got an N equal to a negative 44 do you think that this is a correct answer or could be this could be a correct answer? As soon as you solve for N, which is the number of time periods, and you see a negative value, you know that you did something incorrectly. 
Anytime you get a negative N, you cannot have a negative time period. Something was done incorrectly. You would get this negative uh, number of periods if you did not put in this negative 20 on your payment. So it's important that you always have at least a negative on one of the cash flows. Uh, we try to be consistent and have cash inflows as positives and cash outflows as negatives. But you, uh, whenever you get this negative value as an N, uh, that should be the first showcase to you that something was not input correctly. Additionally, if you ever see when you're doing your calculations, error 5, that also means that you did not input something correctly on your financial calculators. Okay, moving forward. We are getting ready to retire. Our parents are getting ready to retire and decide to convert some of the retirement portfolio um, into an annuity that guarantees them a fixed annual income. The insurance agent's agent asked for $425,000 for an annuity that guarantees to pay them $65,000 a year, meaning that we have an annuity, constant cash flow, equally spaced, so $65,000 every year for a finite period of time, 12 years. What is the rate? So hopefully you're seeing that we are solving for the IY. So we have present value, we have future value, we have payment, we have N, and we have IY. So these are all needed to be input in on an annual basis, so on a yearly basis, I would end up having to pay $425,000, or my parents would have to pay $425,000 for this annuity, and since they are paying it, I'm going to list it as a negative value. The cash flow that they would be receiving each year is $65,000 a year, and they would receive it for 12 years. We are solving for the rate of return, and there is not an additional cash flow at the end of the 12 years, so I'm going to keep that future value as zero, as similar to the other problems. When I solve for the IY, I end up getting a 10.85% return. So in this particular example, let's say your parents have another opportunity, another investment opportunity that, that guarantees an 11% return, then obviously they would take that other opportunity, but this is a good way to compare different cash flow streams and identify what type of return you are getting on a particular investment. Moving forward again. Now we are investing $5,000 a year at the end of each year. Uh, unless said otherwise, cash flows occur at the end of the period, which is very key, okay? Um, so unless they say otherwise, we assume that cash flows occur at the end of a period. That is the definition of an ordinary annuity. So in this particular example, it says I decide to invest $5,000 a year. Once again, $5,000 a year lets us know that we are dealing with an annuity. Each year into an, a retirement account paying 6% compounded annually. If I retire in 35 years, how much will I have? Hopefully you see that we are solving for the future value. So once again, you could solve for the future value here by utilizing this equation. On the last example, we would have been solving for the R in this present value, which would have been much more complex calculations. But in this example, we're solving for the future value. I recommend uh, doing whichever seems whichever method uh, you prefer. I'm going to solve them using the financial calculator, which, as I've mentioned previously, is really the exact same thing as what you put into Excel if you want to use Excel instead or you don't have a financial calculator. So all of these is annually, so they're all going to be put in on a yearly basis. I'm starting off with nothing in this account. It doesn't say that I'm starting with anything in my retirement account. I'm starting off with zero. There is no cash flow that's occurring in, at the beginning in time period zero. The constant cash flow is 5000 so I'm going to list as a negative 5000 as that would be a negative cash flow or a cash outflow from my perspective. N is 35, 35 years. Everything's input in annually. IY is 6%. Calculating the future value, if I were to invest $5,000 a year for 35 years at a 6% interest rate, I'd end up getting a future value of $557,173.90. Let's do one more. You decide to make monthly payments of $125 into a retirement account that pays 11% interest compounded monthly. So once again, some key words to pick up on, monthly payments, meaning that I have, first of all, that everything needs to be input in as monthly. Second of all, constant cash flow equally spaced for a finite period of time means I'm dealing with an annuity, so I'm going to be utilizing the payment function. How large will my retirement be in 20 years? So same scenario as the last one, a constant cash flow, except now they're monthly payments instead of annual payments. So once again, you'll, you are, I hope you're noticing that with all these calculations, I set them up the exact same way. 
I group my payment, my N, and my IY together because those all need to be inputted on the same basis, in this case months, and I will set up every one of these problems in the exact same format. I recommend that you do so as well. They want to know how large will my retirement be in 20 years, so I'm solving for the future value. I'm starting with nothing in my retirement account. I'm making a payment of $125. Hopefully, you're looking at the screen right now and saying, put that negative out there in front since it's a cash outflow. I'm doing this for 20 years, but with monthly payments, I need to multiply that 20 by 12 for a total of 240 payments uh, total over this 20-year period. And if it is 11% interest, I need to divide that by 12. And hopefully you're, you're picking up and saying, okay, I need to do 11 divided by 12 equals and get this 0.916667, realizing that there are numbers at the end of this 7. And then I hit the equals IY button so that the full decimal is stored. And if you have any questions about that, don't hesitate to email me and I'll try to explain it differently so that you realize that the full decimal should be stored in that IY. Otherwise, your answer might be slightly different. And then when I go ahead and solve for the future value here, I would end up seeing that at the end of this 20 years, I would have $108,204.75. So what we've done uh, throughout these practice problems is we've taken annuities, so constant cash flows that occur equally spaced for a finite period of time, and we've calculated the present value. We've also been able to take what the present value is and calculate what the constant payment would be. We've figured out how, how uh, the number of periods, so we've solved for an N, we solved for an IY, we solved for a future value. So hopefully you have a good idea as to how to solve for these different uh, these different inputs. Okay, uh, we have another another problem here. Plan on saving one fifty a month each month for the next two years, beginning today, with an APR of three point five percent with monthly compounding. How much will you have in two years? You're looking at this problem and you're probably saying, "Okay, I'm solving for the future value. No different than the last two problems. Problems, except there is one key difference. The key difference being beginning today." I told you uh, in a previous problem that you always assume that the cash flows occur at the end of the period. That is an ordinary annuity. That's what these equations are for. That's how our calculator is set up. It's to solve for these as if they are an ordinary annuity where the cash flows occur at the end of the period. If the cash flows occur at the beginning of the period, your timeline would look something like this. So in this case, it is two years for every month. So I'm just going to put this in month. This would be 24 months. And at the beginning, I'm investing $150. So I'm investing $150 24 times, and you'll notice that I do not have a cash flow here in this, in this future value amount. Uh, the difference in, uh, versus an ordinary annuity, with an ordinary annuity, my first cash flow would be at the end of the period. So I would have cash flows occurring from year one to the 24th. So hopefully, as you can imagine, if my cash flows are delayed or, or begin immediately, it's going to have an impact on the present value or the, and the future value. So we can't use the exact same equation. However, we can use the same process. We just need to make one small change on our financial calculators. We need to let our calculator know that the cash flow occurs immediately as opposed to at the end of the period. So to adjust our calculator into annuity due mode, what you will hit is the second button. And so when you hit second, I want you to hit second, then PMT. It should say end. When you see end, if you hit... Second, enter. It should toggle between end and now say BGN. If it says BGN, that means your calculator is now in, in beginning mode, and whatever you put in for the payment is assumed to occur at the beginning of the period, which is what happens with the, an, an, annuity, uh, an annuity due. So if I just hit the clear work button, you're going to see up above your numbers, it's going to say BGN. It's important to note when you are in beginning mode, because if you stay in that mode and solve for an ordinary annuity value, uh, you're going to get the wrong answer if you're still in beginning mode. So it's just important that whenever you change into beginning mode, I highly recommend putting it back into end mode. Um, 
just because ordinary annuities are more common than annuity dues. So now that I am in beginning mode and my calculator knows that my cash flows of $150 a month each month occur at the beginning of the period, now I'm going to solve for the future value the same way that I would otherwise. So once again, I'm grouping these together. What are my payment, my N, and my IY all going to be input in as? I'll input in as monthly. The payment is $150, and I'm going to represent that with a negative value since that would be a cash outflow. I'm starting with zero. The N is two years, but monthly compounding for a total of 24 periods. The IY is 3.5% per year, but I need to input in on a monthly basis. So when I divide by 12, I end up getting uh, 0.29%. One six six seven. Do you think that there's values here after the seven? Most likely. So what I would do is hit three point five divided by twelve equals, and then hit the IY button so that the full decimal is stored. And I am solving for the future value. When I solve for the future value, I get a value of three thousand seven hundred and thirty-four dollars and twenty-three cents. Now, I would always recommend that once you solve an annuity due problem where your calculator is in beginning mode, I would go back into ordinary mode. So you're going to go second PMT, hit second enter. It's going to go back to end mode. And now, you're not, and now your calculator knows that whatever value you input in for, um, for your payment occurs at the end of the period. For those of you using Excel, that would be in regards to the zero or the one at the end of the period or at the end of the equation. If you type in zero, it means that it occurs at the beginning of the period. If you type in one, it occurs at the end of the period. So just keep that in mind that timing of the cash flows obviously would affect uh, the future and present value since it affects when the actual cash flows occur. Taking a look at this next problem, I want to lease a building from Buildings R Us for $52,000. The lease is in the form of, just so I can read this a little bit better, of an 84-month annuity with payments beginning today. The APR in the lease is 7.2%. What will be your monthly payment? So hopefully you're seeing that this is a monthly item, so all of my inputs need to be input in as monthly, and I'm solving for the payment. So I have present value, future value, payment, and in IY. Another big thing, well with these all needing to be input in as monthly, hopefully you're also noticing that this is saying payments beginning today. What does that mean? This means that this is an annuity due. So what do I need to do? I need to switch my calculator. So once again, second PMT, second enter, and I will know that my calculator is in beginning mode because it will say BGN, and then it will also say BGN up above my numbers. So then when I hit clear work, I see BGN up, against, up above my numbers. I want to know what is my monthly payment, so I know I'm solving for the PMT. They actually give me the number of payments in a monthly form, so it's just 84. The APR is 7.2%, but that's an annual rate, so I need to divide it by 12. So I get 0.6 as my interest rate per period. The amount of the loan is 52000 so um, that's a positive value because that's what I'm borrowing, and then the payment's going to end up being a negative, and the future value is going to be zero on this, on this lease. When I solve for the payment, I end up getting a payment that is equal to negative $785.20. Is that a negative value? No. It just means I'm paying $785.20 to pay off this $52,000 lease. Okay, so that is our annuity discussion. We started off with, um, with calculating the present value of an annuity, then we calculated the payment on an annuity, then we calculated the number of periods on an, on an annuity, we calculated the interest rate on an annuity, and then we also calculated the future value. The last two questions dealt with annuity dues where the cash flows occur at the beginning of the period. Now, what if I have a constant cash flow that occurs equally spaced, but it goes on forever? How can I put that on my calculator if I don't have anything to put in for the end? If it goes on forever, I can't put in the number of compounding periods. This is what is called a perpetuity. When you have a perpetuity, you cannot use your financial calculators. You have to use an equation because if it goes on forever, you can't use your N in your financial calculators. So what is the equation? The equation says present value of an annuity that goes on forever, so a perpetuity, 
equals whatever that constant cash flow is divided by the interest rate. Okay, so if you'll notice, the PVA that goes on forever is simply the present value of the cash flows. The cash flow is that constant payment. The I is your relevant interest rate. And the other two, we can't solve for the future value if it goes on forever, and we can't solve for the number of periods since it goes on forever. So we are essentially using the three of the five inputs that apply towards a perpetuity based on the characteristic that it's a cash flow that goes on forever. So now it's just understanding which of the inputs is provided. So in this case, I am investing $250,000 at 6%, and they want to know what the payment amount is. What is the constant cash flow? That means I'm solving for the CF. So I'm investing $250,000. That is my present value of the annuity. I'm solving for the cash flow, and the interest rate per period is 6% plugged in as a decimal. I solve for that constant cash flow, and I get a cash flow amount that is equal to $15,000. Looking at the next problem, how much would I have to invest to receive fixed payments of $10,000 forever if their interest rate is 10%? Hopefully you're seeing that this is the cash flow, and I need to solve for how much I would have to invest. So in current value terms, that's the present value of the annuity that goes on forever, which is a perpetuity. So my equation says I'm solving for this. The constant cash flow is $10,000. The interest rate is 0.1 or 10%, and hopefully you can see that the present value then would be $100,000. Now, the last question here deals with solving for the effective annual rate of return. Hopefully, in your readings, you saw that uh, in our calculations, our interest rates have been provided as what is called a simple interest rate or a nominal interest rate, which is just the interest rate per period multiplied by the number of periods, and that's how they get the yearly rate. Uh, and that's why, in, for example, in this particular problem, we took the 7.2 and divided by 12 to get the interest rate per period. That is not the true rate that takes into consideration compounding. The rate that takes into consideration compounding, that after that first period you start to have compound interest, would be the effective annual rate. The effective annual rate is the true rate of borrowing or the rate that takes into consideration compounding. And in order to solve for the EAR, we use an equation. That equation is 1 plus whatever the quoted rate is. So this is your annual nominal rate or your APR, your, your simple interest rate divided by the number of compounding periods per year, and then we take that uh, value uh, overall and raise it to the number of periods per year, and then we subtract 1. So in this case, I can earn 9% nominal rate with semi-annual compounding. So what I need to do here is actually solve for the, uh, the effective annual rate, where I have 1 plus the quoted rate of 9% plugged in as decimal form, divided by the number of compounding periods per year, which in this case is 2 because it's semi-annual compounding. I'm going to raise the whole thing to the second power, and now, then I will subtract 1. The steps that I recommend for this, since uh, we're us utilizing an exponent on our financial calculator, is I would first do the 0 .09 divided by 2, and then I would add 1 to this value, and then I hit y to the x to raise it to the exponent of 2 in this case. And then the fourth step then would be to subtract 1. When I follow these steps, I end up getting an EAR that is equal to 0 0.092025 or 9.2025%. Your EAR will always be greater than your APR or your, your quoted rate if you have more than one compounding period because this is the rate that takes into consideration compounding. So this is the rate that, that understands that after that first period, you start to have interest on interest, whether it be on a loan or on some kind of, uh, of, of credit card. Uh, you start to have interest on interest um, on, these different, uh, on these different items. So... Those are the practice problems from Chapter 6, dealing with multiple cash flows, both of the same amount and of different sizes, same amount being annuities or perpetuities. We have annuity dues and we have ordinary annuities, uh, depending on when the cash flows occur at the end of the period or at the beginning of the period, and then cash flows of different sizes. Um, if you have any trouble with these, with these practice problems or if you have any questions or need some help with the calculator or with Excel, don't hesitate to email me, um, and I will talk to you all soon. Good luck.